thank you, Father. In fact, I think it'd be appropriate right now if we would just take a moment. Often as we ask the Lord to examine our hearts, is there something, an anxious thought, a fear, something that's been pressing in on you? One of my favorite thoughts is that the ground around the cross is level ground. Meaning this, that there's no Jew or Gentile, male or female. Does, none of those things matter. We are just you and God. And we are laid exposed there. So I'm just going to pray over you this morning. And I'm just going to encourage you, if there's something there this morning, the Holy Spirit's nudged you, would you just lay it there? kind of in, in, in a symbolic way of saying, I'm just placing this at the feet of Jesus. Father God, this morning, Lord God, we just give you our lives. God, I pray for those that are just, th their thoughts have been filled with anxiety, God. It, it's almost as though it's something they can't push through, Lord God. God, I pray that you would God, expose that today. God, search us, Lord God. God, any of our fears, our worry, our anxiety, God, that we would just lay it before you, God. God, I pray for those that maybe in this moment there was some secret sin that was brought forward, Lord God, that we would deal with it with you, Lord, today. Father God, I thank you that you search us and you know us. That you desire relationship with us, God. God, I thank you for the convicting power of your Holy Spirit this morning. God, let us not... Let us not take for granted your correction, I pray, in our hearts. <clears throat> now, God, I also thank you, God, that the, the result of that is the weight of, of sin and worry and anxiety lifted off our shoulders. That we can step forward into all that you've called us to do. God, I pray for your people today. God, for those that are here and those that are online, God, that you would bless them. God, give us clarity, I pray, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hey, if uh, as you're grabbing your seat, would you just turn and wave at somebody? If you're at home, here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Those of you that are home, if you would uh, send a text to somebody that you haven't seen in a while, maybe a church family member, and uh, and just encourage them today. I give you permission, not that you need my permission, but I encourage you to do that right now and uh, say hi to somebody. That would be amazing. I just want to say a huge thank you to, uh, to all of you, first and foremost. You're, you've been so incredibly faithful uh, in your giving and in, in responding. Uh, as we continue to ramp up into this fall, uh, we're continuing to add activities. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we're back to all of our full Wednesday night activities, Club 316. In fact, if you serve with the kids, that's with Pastor Nikki. Uh, I believe they're doing root beer floats. That sounds awesome. Um, but you have to be a volunteer or a kid, so just lay that out there. So she does some pretty cool things. Uh, Pastor Kim and, and the youth, they're meeting back in full. And then we also have a Bible study that meets here. Uh, Pastor Andy Tramp leads that, and uh, there's a group that comes. So there's something for all ages, and so uh, come and be a part of that. In fact, uh, the Wednesday night Bible study, there's getting to be a few people in there. We had to put a fan in the room. Uh, they were getting a, a little warm in there over the last few weeks, and so... Listen, come, participate. There's opportunities there for you. I uh, also wanted you to know that Thursdays throughout the month of September, uh, we're going to do uh, some times of corporate prayer. Uh, so Thursdays at 5.30, 5.30 to 6.30 here in the sanctuary. And here's, here's my heart behind this. Really, since we began this series, we needed to have some just seasons of corporate prayer. And I know that part of you live out of town, and some of you are good ways out of town. Um, we went with 5.30 hoping to gather some, grabbing some people before they went home from work and those kind of things. But, but here's what I'm really looking for is for people to be in prayer. So whether you're able to be here or maybe say, you know what, we're, we can't come into town all those Thursdays, but we can be in our homes. Uh, join with us during that hour from 5.30 to 6.30 uh, during the Thursdays throughout the month of September. I encourage you to do that. Uh, listen, no huge agendas. We may have some prayer points and some things like that, but we're just we're gathering just to seek the Lord. Spending time in his presence in prayer, so be aware 
of that. I mentioned it earlier. There is an online connection card at yanktonassembly.com under the About Us tab. Click Connection Card. And inside of there, there's some questions at the end. You can just update your information or you can also uh, sign up for baptism or membership, uh, uh, life groups, and a number of other things. And the last thing is this. We are uh, looking forward to ramping up our life groups this fall. If you're already in a life group, you've been in one in the past, uh, uh, listen, be in contact with your life group leader. Uh, but if you've never been in a life group before, uh, we have some sign-up sheets out front. If you say, well, nothing seems to fit me, uh, grab me, and I would love to have a conversation with you about how we can make that fit for you. Cool? Last thing is this. If you need to give, you want to give today at the end of service, you can do that in the by the back doors. Persistence. Persistence. Have you ever known a kid that just would never give up, right? Like when they're really little and they want to like wrestle or, or get something and they just won't stop. How many of you were that kid when you were little? Okay. I should raise both hands, okay? My mom said when I was really small that I would never try to stop wrestling with my dad until I would walk away crying. So like it just, I wouldn't quit until that point came. Uh, small, don't really remember that part of it, but persistence. Persistence is an interesting thing. Today we're talking about prayer. Specifically, we're going to talk about praying hard today. There's an idea in prayer that um, isn't talked about a whole lot anymore, but I remember uh, as a child hearing it often, and it's the thought of praying through. Praying through. And the thought behind it is simply this. Being in prayer until you get an answer from God. And that, by the way, that answer generally comes in one of three forms. Yes, no, or wait. I'm amazed at how many times God tells me to wait. Right? And yet, the reality is, is God wants to answer our prayers. And, and I wonder if there's something that maybe, just maybe, in our ever-changing, fast-paced society with social media and instant gratification, if we've missed something when it comes to prayer with the idea of actually taking time to pray through something, really getting to God's heart. Persistence is interesting. They did a study comparing American students to students around the world in different countries, specifically in the area of mathematics. And they wondered, was it a difference in intelligence or was there something else that was underneath all of it. One of the interesting things they found, they, they took a bunch of first graders and they actually gave them an incredibly difficult puzzle, a puzzle they knew that it's doubtful that any first grader would solve it. But what they were trying to figure out is how long the students would actually spend on the puzzle. One of the countries that they were looking at specifically that typically uh, uh, score much higher than American students did in mathematics the children there averaged 47% longer working on the puzzle. American students averaged about 9.47 minutes. These students averaged almost 14 minutes working on the puzzle. And what the researchers found was that it had, they, they, they believed this, it had less to do with intelligence and more to do with persistence. Found that interesting, right? Okay, I'm going somewhere with this this morning. I want you to see something today. There's another theory on what it means to be excellent at something, to, to, to truly succeed. In fact, most people believe, whether it's athletics or music or whatever, that success is a derivative of persistence. In fact, if you look at the most successful people in the world, whether they're musicians or athletes, you will find out that none of them happened to be that. They all grew up with this tenacity to succeed. Let me illustrate it to you this way. There was an individual at the Berlin Elite Academy of Music that did a study of musicians, specifically looking at violinists. Now, listen, here's the deal. An incredibly complicated mu mu uh, instrument. I am not a musician myself. I am always... How many of you are in awe of someone who's just incredibly musically gifted, right? Uh, how many of you recognize that just didn't happen, right? It takes an incredible amount of work, 
But here's the interesting that this, this music academy found. They divided their violinists up into three groups, world-class soloists, good violinists, and then the, you could tell they were searching for the right word for the third group. So they simply called them those who were unlikely to play professionally. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a good way of just saying they're, they're just not as good. Uh, all of them, and here's the interesting part, all of them started playing at roughly the same age, okay? And they practiced roughly the same amount of time until age eight. But that's where their practice habits begin to diverge from one another. The researchers found that by age 20, the average players who were not particularly going to play professionally, right, had logged about 4,000 hours of practice time. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a significant amount of time to me, right? They said this, that the good violinists had about 8,000 hours of practice time. Now you can understand the disparity in the difference between the two groups. But the elite performers, every one of them, had set a standard with a minimum of 10,000 hours of practice. You can do the research, you can Google things. It's a really interesting thing, whether it's sports or, or music or whatever. There seems to be this 10,000-hour rule. Now, now, hear me very closely, okay? I promise you this. Had I spent 10,000 hours playing basketball, I still wouldn't have been in the NBA, okay? <laughs> there, there has to be some level of natural proclivity, right, that goes along with that. But if you have some of those natural giftings and you apply to it the work that's necessary. And they said this, the researchers said this, it seems that it takes the brain that long to assimilate everything that you need to achieve true mastery of the art or the skill. So you say, okay, pastor, what does that have to do with praying hard? My question is simply this. Is it any different with our prayer lives? Now, before you go there, I am not trying to boil prayer down to playing a violin or playing sports. But what I am saying is, is if you're going to master any of those things, it takes roughly 10,000 hours of time. And what would happen in our lives if we applied some of those same metrics to our prayer lives? Now, I don't think any of us in this room have probably set the lifetime timer on our time in prayer. And that's ultimately not even what I'm encouraging you with. But what I encourage you with is, in fact, I'll put it in the first slide. If you can go throw up the first slide, if you would, really quick. Uh, it says, praying is. And I just want to give you three quick thoughts about praying. Praying is a habit to be cultivated. By the way, how many of you guys know that uh, bad habits are easier to catch than good habits? Right? We seem to catch bad habits, but good habits, not so much. They're a discipline to be developed and a skill to be practiced, which is really three ways of kind of saying the same thing, right? But I want you to think about the fact of skills and habits and disciplines in our lives. Now, how many, would you be honest, how many of you hear those words and think, boring, right? We just be honest a little bit. We, we hear those words like discipline and skill and practice, and it, and it kind of becomes boring. But here, here's what I want you to see. The world-class violinist practice but has the ability to perform on stage, right? The athlete has the same type of thing. You say, well, what is it for those of us in prayer? Listen, as we begin to spend more time in prayer, I promise you this, you're going to see God answer more of your prayers. The more time you spend in prayer, the more it seems that God shows up on the scene, changes things in the atmosphere, adjusts things in your family lives. By the way, the number one thing is that he adjusts is yourself. You see, we get on the same page with him. I said it earlier, I don't want to just reduce prayer down to time logged, but I do want to make sure that as men and women of God, we don't miss out on this incredibly vital part of our faith walk. I don't want us to just think that prayer is some habit that we do or something that we log the time to just do this God thing that he's asked us to do. No, listen, there's an intimacy that's produced out of time. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. I want to show you this in Scripture. 
at least the, the genesis of the thought for what I want to talk to you about today, about the idea of praying hard, really taking time to pray through and seek what God would have. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Verse 1 says this, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and what? Not give up. They should always pray and not give up. If you're somebody who writes in your Bibles, I encourage you to underline that part. So Jesus said, listen, I'm going to tell you a story. And here's what I'm going to illustrate to you, that you should always be people of prayer and not give up. It's interesting to me that a couple weeks ago we, we saw uh, this, this idea of persistence come through in a, in a different passage, and now we hear again with this picture that Jesus is giving about prayer. We know that Jesus himself was a persistent person in prayer, that he would often go away and spend time in prayer. The disciples saw that, and he said, listen, I'm going to I'm gonna tell you a story. They should always pray and not give up. Verse 2. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen, listen to what the Lord says. Listen to what the unjust, unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen people who what? Who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus covers a lot of ground in this short story that he shares with them, this parable to teach them. And he chooses to set the scene of a judge who doesn't really care about God or care about anything, really, or people. And this persistent widow. Have you noticed that it's often he, Jesus uses these things that give us uh, the reality of people who are desperate? right? He shares the idea of the persistent widow. We don't know her story, right? We don't know everything that's going on. But for some reason, there's been an injustice. Maybe her son's in jail. Maybe the reason that she's a widow. Maybe something happened to her husband and, the, and, and, and his murderer is still out there and she wants justice. And, and it really doesn't matter because Jesus doesn't tell us exactly what it is. But he gives us this person so that we can empathize with them to begin to understand the desperation with which this person comes in prayer. It's interesting how many times, and if you just begin to read through the Gospels, how many times this picture of prayer comes up. People who are in a desperate moment who need God to move. It, it's, it's this almost, you, you can almost see her pounding, right, at the judge's door. Like, I'm not going to give up. That You're not getting rid of me that easy. In fact, there's an interesting comment that's made in, in this scripture by the judge. He said, even though, I don't, uh, even though I don't fear God or care about people, it keeps bothering me. And he says, eventually, she may come and attack me. Right? There is something that is tenacious in her cry for justice. There is something that's heartfelt I mean, you get the picture, right? This woman who went through something and the tears in her eyes and this judge who has, as the scripture says, very little heart, eventually said, I, I'm going to do this. And then Jesus asks some larger questions. He talks about the love the Father has and he says, will not God bring about justice for his chosen people? And then he ends it with the question, but when the Son of Man comes, will there be faith on the earth? Often praying through means that we pray hard. We begin to pray the will of God. I talked last week about determining what the will of God. We need to be praying in accordance with God's will. These aren't just 
our desires, right? If you missed the message a couple weeks ago, I encourage you to listen to that. We talked about how the, the getting on the same page with God is so incredibly important. But this, this, this passage is interesting because the phrase used in the widow's persistence is actually uh, boxing terminology. Okay? <laughs> Basically this, you said, listen, the, the judge in the story that you saw about it said, listen, she is wearing me out. Right? We are in round 12 and she is not giving up. So here's the question I have for us today. When's the last time we prayed like that? Now hear, hear me. If the first response you had was to feel guilty, that's not the response the Holy Spirit wants you to have. Okay? A simple question is this, are we willing to pray through? And, and, and by the way, praying through on things that aren't necessarily in desperate moments. All of us in this room, I'm sure, have had a desperate moment where we've been driven to our knees in prayer. I'm talking about beginning to understand and, and, and beginning to seek God. Praying a prayer something like this, and getting on our knees and just saying, God, I don't need anything today. I just need your heart, God. I need your heart for the people I work with. God, I need to see my community the way that you see my community. God, I, I need to see the people that I disagree with the way that you see them. God, give me eyes to see and ears to hear what your Spirit would say. I promise you, if you begin to pray prayers like that, there will be a growing desperation in your heart for the things of God. Because if you really want God's heart, God's heart breaks over lost people. And God looks at our cities and towns and He weeps for those that don't know Him. It's a prayer that says, God, give me a heart like yours. And here's the crazy thing about prayer. Prayer understands something. Prayer understands that we seek the Lord and we do everything in our power. We apply our gifts and our ability and ultimately we understand that anything that happened is completely dependent upon Him. Right? So you and I work like it depends on us, but yet we understand that it's completely dependent upon the Lord. My hope is this, is that it doesn't take a desperate moment for you to understand how to seek God in a desperate way. That we begin to develop in ourselves what this widow had. That we would approach God, who by the way is not an unjust judge, right? He's very... In fact, He is justice. So for God who knows us and, and desires to do things, and yet He chooses prayer. He chooses prayer. Prayer is the key that unlocks the door. It's interesting as well because the widow's methodology is a little unorthodox, isn't it? Like how, how, how many of you would say that, that it would be normal protocol to go find the judge's house and start beating on his door? In fact, um, it's the reason it's, 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 it's a parable, um, not a wise choice, by the way, right? <laughs> in real life. But what do we need to do to honor God in our prayer lives? What does it need to look like? I was having a conversation with a lady in our previous church, and God began to really stir in her heart this idea of prayer. And she really wanted to see this happen and so uh she it, it was amazing as god began to work on she literally went in her house and built a prayer room that they remodeled an old closet whatever and it was a prayer room and no one in the house was allowed to go in there unless they were going to be in prayer but it revolutionized the literally revolutionized the way she began to live her life and what god was doing in, in her heart and her life i understand that not every one of you do with that will do that and i'm not saying that that's what every one of you are called to but I do know this, that all of us are called to be people that pray. To spend time in God's presence. Listen, not because we have to, but because we get to. Spending time with the Lord. Being quiet in His presence. Finding that place, finding that time of day, what fits for you. Beginning to seek Him. I, I know this in my own life. When I spend time with the Lord, I'm, amazing. I'm amazed at how often things go well 
But sometimes those mornings when I'm rushed and kids and everything else and I kind of just get a little time in and I move forward with my day, how often my day becomes so frustrated, right? And I think back to the end of the day, if I had just taken extra time to pray today, how many of these other things would have probably worked out much better than they did? It's, and, and listen, I'm not saying there isn't going to be spiritual attack. There will, but there's growth that comes when we begin to seek God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do we know him? Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 27. I actually shared these verses last week, but I want to share them again to remind you. It says this, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We, don't know, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Listen, as Spirit-filled believers, it's important that we be our people that pray in the Spirit. That's what Paul's referencing here. That we begin to pray over things, but we pray in the Spirit. Why? Because we pray in the Spirit, we pray the perfect will of God. Isn't that kind of a cool thought? There's a dimension to that. That if we'll allow the Spirit to pray through us. Then people say, well, why do we need that now? Why is that important? Listen, I don't know about you, there are times when it's like, I know God's revealing things to me, and then there are other times where I'm like, I don't, I don't know how to pray over that. But here's what I found. So many times when you pray in the Spirit over something, and, and Paul says we, we include our mind in that, right? So we're praying in the Spirit when we engage our mind with a thing we're praying over. I'm amazed at how many times when we take the time to do that, that it seems like in a short amount of time after that, God will begin to give us key things to pray for. It's like somehow he lets us in on the thing that we've been praying for. We don't even know what we're praying for. I'm getting a lot of blank stares this morning. Okay? Just encourage you with something today. There's a dimension in our prayer life that God wants to take us to that allows us to pray his perfect will over situations in our life. I don't know what's coming next, specifically talking about your life. We can talk about the world at large and all the things that are coming and, and, and things that are happening, but I'm not going to go there today. I just want to talk about you for just a moment. I don't know what the rest of 2020 has. I've seen a lot of memes on social media that just everyone's saying, let's just get on to 2021, right? You may get through the rest of this year and everything may go well. But here's what I do know. At some point, at some point, if you live long enough, you're going to face a challenge in the coming days, weeks, months, or years ahead. That's not meant to scare you. It's just, just the reality of life. That's how life works. We live in a sinful world and there will be challenges. So the question is this. Are you beginning now to build the spiritual muscle that you need in order to to not just survive that, but to meet it head on. I don't know about you, I, I don't want to just survive the next round of spiritual warfare. I want to thrive through it. I want to meet it head on. I want to know that I know that I know that God has given me a word, that He's given me promises that I've already claimed, and that I'm ready. I'm ready. Listen, we as believers don't have to be tattered and worn at the end of the battle. And I promise you this, there's going to be scars and there's going to be tired moments, but we can be filled with the Spirit and meet things head on. I believe it's time that we not be passive, but we be persistent in our prayer lives. Again, I don't know what God has coming for you next, but I know this, that we have an enemy that has a plan, and if you get engaged in the things of God, the enemy's going to come against you. So let's be ready. Let's be ready to face it. Let's be ready to claim his promises and seek what he has for us. I believe this, it often begins by praying through God's word. You see, the two are, they're just incredibly linked to one another. I don't believe you can have an effective prayer life unless you're a person who's in God's Word. And if you're in God's Word, the only way for God's Word to be truly effective is if you're a person of prayer. They just work. 
with one another. It's how God designed it to be. And it bolsters our faith. And here's one of the things that you see all throughout Scripture. You see people spending time in prayer. It's amazing. I mean, I could tell you story after story, even just even in the Old Testament. In fact, one of my, one of my favorites, I was reading through, 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 through some things this week, thinking about this message, thinking about persistency in prayer. And I was reminded of the story of Elijah. Not the one that most people think of when Elijah's on Mount Carmel and defeating the prophets of Baal, which, by the way, one of my favorites as well. But shortly after that, as soon as that scene is over and many people's faith is restored that God is the God of Israel, Elijah says this. He says, I hear the sound of rain. Which, by the way, is kind of, just kind of tucked to there. They had been in a three-year drought. And God had promised Elijah that he was going to send rain. And he begins to pray. Here's the interesting part. Elijah says, I hear the sound of rain. He knows that God is sending rain. And yet, and yet, hear me, there was a part that Elijah still had to play in prayer. This is, and it, it's fascinating if you read it. He goes and he prays and he sends his helper to say, do you see anything? If you've never read this before, it's in first. I think first or second Kings. I didn't write it down. It's in the book of Kings, one of the Kings. All right. You can look at it later. It's around chapter 18 or 19, somewhere in there. But he sends his servant to go and look, and the servant goes and looks, and he's like, nothing. So he prays again. He sends him again. This goes on and on and on. The sixth time he sends his servant, and his servant comes back, and he said, I don't see anything. If we're being honest, how many of us would have, been, would have either given up already or after the sixth time would have been like, yeah, I'm out, right? One more time, he sends his servant. Seventh time, the servant goes and he said, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Which, by the way, if I were that persistent in prayer and he came back and he told me that, I'd have probably said, oh, okay, it's a good start. I'm going to go back and pray again. All right? <laughs> you know. But he knew. He knew that was a sign from the Lord. And, and God sent rain on the land. Without reading too much into Scripture, I just have a simple question for you. I talked a couple weeks ago about circling promises, claiming promises of God's Word. By the way, conservative account, there's over 3,000 promises in God's Word. Now listen, let me just give a quick pastoral thought here. Okay? We're not willy-nilly with the Word of God. We don't try to twist it to make it fit what we want. We don't try to get permission from God's Word by making it say things that we want it to say. But I believe as we seek God in prayer, there are promises that are revealed to us. Now, there are universal promises. Like, listen, if you're a parent, you need to start claiming every scripture that talks about your kids serving the Lord and their relationship with Him, and those are your promises. What I'm simply saying is this. We don't twist God's Word. We don't take it out of context. And yet, there are so many promises for us to begin to pray in God's Word. For us to begin to say, God, I want you to do this in the life of my family and my kids and the people around me. I believe it's not only what we should do, but I believe it's one of the responsibilities of those of us who know Christ is to seek God and to claim His promises over those that we love and, and over our communities, the people that we serve and the people that we care about. Elijah didn't give up, and he prayed. He continued to go back to that promise. And here's what I, what I want you to see. How many times do you and I give up after the fourth, fifth, or sixth time and we miss out on that seventh time? In fact, there's some of you right now, God has made promises to you. He's given you scripture. He, you know, something you've claimed and you've prayed over before. I believe that God wants to breathe new life back into some of those things that maybe just maybe you didn't push into quite far enough. Hear me. Hear me. I'm not saying we make God do things, but I do know we participate with Him. You say, how do you know? It's all over Scripture. We don't know the spiritual battle that's always taking place. We don't know all the things that are going around it, but we do know this, is that as Elijah went and as he prayed, and after the seventh time, the sky grew black and heavy rains begin to, heavy winds, excuse me, begin to blow and rain begin to fall. 
after three years of drought. It's easy for us to give up when we've been in a season where it seems like there's no rain. The reason that so many of us give up too soon is because we feel like that we failed God if He doesn't answer our prayer. Hear me this morning. That isn't failure. The only way we fail is when we stop praying. Why? Because God always answers. He always comes through. It's always in His timing and it's always the way that He sees it. It's interesting too that all of this happens after Elijah had went through some incredibly difficult seasons in his life after he had struggled and yet even then as he prayed God sent rain. Let me encourage you again. Our most powerful prayers are linked to the promises of God's Word. I believe that it's so important that we begin to learn how to pray through the Word. Listen, reading God's Word is one way to get through it, right? We, we read it, we get through it. Praying through God's Word is how to get God's Word through us. Listen, I don't care how much Scripture you read each day. I don't care if it's one verse or 14 chapters. We just need to be in God's Word. And we need to be sensitive. We need to be people of prayer. Listen, there, there are days sometimes I'll start reading God's Word and I just get a few verses in and it's like the Holy Spirit's just like, boom, this is where you need to be. We need to be people that pray through His Word. That we spend time seeing His promises. If you're a little bit older in this room, I'm sure you've heard this said many times, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You see, there's a persistence and a tenacity in that. Listen, I'm not talking about a mindless faith. I'm not talking about us not questioning. I'm not talking about not having good theology. But I am talking about getting to a point where my faith says there are things in the spiritual dimension that are beyond my comprehension. That the Almighty God of the universe sets up and accomplishes. I said it earlier, by the most conservative estimates, there are over 3,000 promises in scripture God is able the question is what promises do you and I need to be claiming where do we need to be persistent back in January uh, many of you will remember I went to my grandmother's funeral had the opportunity uh, to preach at my grandmother's funeral along with one of my first cousins and, and my grandma had left some instructions and those instructions included two different psalms that she wanted read at her funeral and each of us took one of those psalms to share at her memorial service each of them had great significance to her and to our family in fact uh, what would it be 19 years almost 19, well, 18 and a half years before that, I had uh, had the opportunity to share at her mother's funeral, my great-grandmother's funeral. And one of those passages of Scripture was a passage of Scripture that my great-grandmother would read every morning and claim those promises over their family. It was out of Psalm 91. I'm not going to read it this morning. I encourage you to read it at some point. Later, it talks about God's protection and His ability. I've shared this story with some of you before, but my great-grandfather was drafted into World War II, left home a pregnant wife with four little girls. An incredibly difficult situation for them. And yet every morning after they got up and did their morning chores and milked the cows and got things taken care of, my great-grandmother would grab my grandma and her sisters and they would sit down in a tree in the front yard and they would read Psalm 91. Begin to claim those promises over my grandfather. And listen, he came home and he told us incredible stories of God's protection. Of being covered waist deep in, in mud from some artillery that landed near him, covered him, but did not explode. At times, grenades would land near him and not go off. 
Now listen, you and I can say, oh, that was just coincidence, or you know, they just didn't have very good you know, artillery back then, or however you want to say it. But listen, you can either do that, or you can choose to say, I serve a God that is able. And we can get into the conversations of, well, you know, they weren't, we weren't the only family that was praying, and we were and I get that. Why was this person protected? Listen, I don't have all of those big answers, but what I do know is that when my great-grandmother got on her knees and my grandmother and her sisters prayed, my grandfather saw the protective hand of God. You see, the promises of God are linked to our lives, and I'm sure that if we went around this morning, and if you begin to go back through and begin to think of the things that God has done for you. I close with this. Last thought this morning. I was doing some reading and I was thinking about prayer and what does prayer look like and how does you know how do these things happen? Here's the one thing that I that I recognize. A little over, well not I shouldn't say a little over, a little under two years ago, God was doing some interesting stirring in my wife and I's hearts. It was during that time period that we knew that we would be coming here to take over the role as pastor of this church. And there's always interesting questions, but I know this with all of my heart that everything that we see around us today is an answer to prayer. Everything from the chairs you sit in to this building to everything that God has done is an answer to someone's prayer. When I first came, I was given a booklet from a number of years ago that talked about some of the history of this church. And I just, I just want to share a quick story with you. I reread it again last night because it, it reminded me once again, why are we here? Why is this important? You see, we're called to be people of prayer. The church used to be at a different location. The people that were here at that time, and there may be some of you in the room that were here at that time, I would say most, a good majority of you weren't. But those people began to pray. During that time, they began to search out a place where they would build a new building. I had to chuckle as I read through some of the things that were written about that conversation and Long story short, they came across this piece of land and they met the gentleman who owned it. They had a conversation with him. And as they began to talk, the gentleman said to them, one of the questions he asked, he said, do you have money people in your church? The pastor at the time said, no, we don't. He wanted to know if there were doctors or lawyers or people who had financial means. He asked him if they had any money. They said, nope, we don't. But the response was simply this, but we've got a big God. As the conversation kind of wound down, the gentleman who owned the land said, well, he had another appointment and that was probably good for now. And They just asked the question, well, what, what would you sell it to us for? What would the terms be? Those kind of things. And the guy said this. He said, you know, he said, I think I'll just give you the land. And then he shared a story about his son shortly before his son died. He said, do everything, anything you can to see the, the lost get to hear about Christ. You see, that's what prayer does. How many people prayed prayers that were a part of this church, people whose names you'll never know, faces you'll never see. You'll know nothing about them. You'll know nothing about the sacrifices they made. And yet, the desire was this, is that lost people would know Jesus. And hear me, that's our responsibility today. That's why we pray. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what the next chapter brings. But we are a part of an unfolding miracle story of God. And God has plans that are so beyond our understanding. And He's putting things together. And listen, hear me, it is daily faithfulness 
woven together with the plan of God that makes miracles happen. We say, oh man, that, the miracle just happened. No, it didn't just happen. People were on their knees praying. They were doing the small, everyday things that sometimes seem inconsequential, and yet that added up to the moment where God showed up on the scene and it changed things. I just want to remind you this morning, why do we pray? Why is it important? Because every one of us in this room have family members who have people who don't know Christ. I spent many years praying for my maternal grandfather. Tried to have conversations with him about Jesus. He had changed the subject. Tell me, you know, if you want to talk to me about it. And I, I often wonder, God, how am I going to break through? And what I didn't know was that God had a plan. In fact, it wasn't until my grandfather's funeral. I, I knew that something had happened. I didn't know all the things. But the last time I'd been with him, I just sensed there was something different going on inside of him. And I met a gentleman who happened to pastor in the Assemblies of God Church. He was the same age as my grandfather. He was my aunt's co-worker's pastor. And he had went into the hospital during one of my, la my grandfather's last spells of sickness. They struck up a friendship. He began to pray with him and led him to Christ. Listen, we don't know what God's doing in the background. Some guy I had never met before. There was no connection other than a co-worker of a family member's pastor who showed up. Why do we pray? Because we have a God who's working and who sees what we don't see. And I encourage you, Thursday night, it's 5.30 to 6.30. I know that may not work for everyone. Find a time, find a place. But I do believe there's power when the church corporately seeks God together. We're going to be here. We'll be in the sanctuary. We'll be praying together. There'll be those of you that'll be at home praying with us. Let's just see what God might do in our community on our behalf. Would you stand with me this morning? I want to pray with us today. I want to encourage those of you that are home if you would pray with us as well. And I just want you, if you know Christ, I just want you to begin to say, God, what, what do you want in my prayer life? What do you want that to look like in me? My, my hope is this, is if you know Christ, that this morning would have been just a little inspiration for you to, to dig a little deeper, to seek what God has for you and for your family, that you would build those spiritual muscles before the battle comes, not waiting until that desperate moment. Father God, I pray for every believer, the sound of my voice, God, those online, those here, God, that you would begin to speak to them now. Holy Spirit, deep into their hearts, God, encouraging them this morning. God, that we would be men and women of prayer, praying for our nation and our communities and our neighbors. God, praying that our hearts would be open. God, claiming the promises of your word, understanding that our daily faithfulness contributes far more to what God is wanting to do than we can ever imagine. Bless them today, I pray. If you know Christ, would you just begin to pray? If you talk to anyone at home or that's here, and you're far from Jesus, you don't know him, you don't have a relationship with him, but you know you need to. Hear me, God's word is very clear. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and then there's a belief, believe in your heart that what? That, that God raised him from the dead, that he is who he said he is, that he did what he said he did, that he died on a cross in your place. And you say, you know what, that, I need him. If you've never done that and you need to do that, I'm just going to invite you. If that's you, would you just slip up a hand? If you're online, you can. There's a couple, depending on the platform, there's some buttons you can click and you can talk to some people. Is there anyone today? Thank you, Father. Father, I worship you. And I praise you now in Jesus' mighty name. God, go with your people. Give them incredible strength. I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's say goodbye to those of you that are online. Listen, if you're in the house today and you need prayer, I'd be more than willing to pray for you. I know there's others around that would as well. So 
depending upon your comfort level, if you need prayer today, we'd love to pray for you guys. Otherwise, be blessed. Have an incredible day. Let's